it's easy, I think, for women to talk to ourselves and say, oh, I must be overthinking it. We won't put the complaints in and vice versa. It's like when we do put a complaint in, it will be minimized. You're listening to Good is in the Details. I'm Gwendolyn Dolsky, and this is the podcast where we learn what we didn't know we didn't know in the spirit of Socrates. My co-host Rudy, he sat out this one, and I'll tell you why. I got his wonderful, fabulous, insightful wife, Dr. Kate Madorn, to do this episode with me. So a little bit of a backstory. I not only create a podcast with Rudy, but I also binge podcasts. And I could not get over the story of a podcast called The Retrievals. Maybe you heard of it. It was at the top of the charts. I'm going to link it in the show notes. The Retrievals was about a fertility clinic where the women patients were going in for their egg retrievals, and they were reporting an excruciating amount of pain. It turns out that the reason they were experiencing all of this pain is because the fentanyl that was supposed to be used to numb the pain during the procedure was non-existent because a nurse had been stealing it. This episode or this podcast just lured me in and made me think about the broader question of not only fertility issues, but the way in which women are treated when it comes to pain. How is pain handled? And I called on Dr. Kate Madoran. She has guest hosted an episode before. She was also on one of our How Do You Maternity episodes. Asked her for some insight into this. And I also contacted my friend, Dr. Christina Tanzavati, also has been a guest of the pod twice. I wanted to know what they thought of the retrievals. Because both women are surgeons and both women have also gone through this procedure. So I just had to know what did they think? What was their reaction? And the conversation was not only about the retrievals, the podcast, but it was also about their experiences as women in surgery, as also patients, and the kinds of things that we should be paying attention to when we are in pain. How do you communicate that? And what on their end are they learning? Lovely episode. Really grateful for these two amazing women to be part of this. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Christina. And let's get to the show with Dr. Kate Madoran and Dr. Christina Tanzavati. What did they think of the retrievals? I thought that this brought out a cultural hurdle of the way in which women's pain is treated. So that was something that I got out of the retrievals. But as both of you, as surgeons, I would really love to know what your impression was, what you were thinking as you were listening to the retrievals. You can go ahead, Kate. This would be doubly interesting for you, Kate, because you also went through the procedure. I did too. I did. I had egg retrieval as well. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So we're on both sides of it. Yeah, I had a lot of thoughts listening to it. There's so many different things to talk about it. You know, there's the the aspect of the pain and then the the actual, like, what happened with the stealing of the medication. Do you want to talk about, like, what my impression was of the women's pain experience being minimized? That was the first thing that I noticed. Yeah. And I was going to kind of share about what my thoughts, particularly outside of just the pain aspect, is that it's how the woman also responded. It's easy, I think, for women to talk to ourselves and say, oh, I must be overthinking it, or I must be, we won't put the complaints in, and vice versa. It's like when we do put a complaint in, it will be minimized. And we're more likely to, not to say this is the right thing or wrong thing, but it's more likely for us to just say, oh, it must be right. They must be right. I must be wrong. Especially in a surgical residency, I think when I was having to deal with, let's say, nurses and going around the rounds and how they might have responded to a male resident was different than how a female nurse would respond to a male resident versus a female resident. Like if I was asking for something, well, it was a question to me versus, oh, sure, we will take care of that. And in the same realm as a patient, if a female nurse right is hearing from a female patient, not to say that that's that it's all on the woman, but I feel like I'm guilty of it too. As a physician, a majority of my patients are female because I do plastic surgery. So I would say about 80 to 90% of my patients are female. And I have to catch myself sometimes jumping to a conclusion that a patient, when they're having a complaint, 
Oh, are they anxious? You know, the word was treating the anxiety as, as you know, one of the patients was saying. They were giving her an anxiety medication rather than giving her a pain medication because they treated it as an anxiety rather than pain. Same thing, like if a patient then complains about something, I'm more likely to say, oh, they're anxious, right? Because my I have a lot of female patients and I have to catch myself sometimes and go, well, if I was in that same situation, would I be reacting the same way? Those are some things I think in my perspective of listening to the story, listening from both the patient perspective side and how they also talked to themselves about the response they were getting from the staff. I think that's right. I think mm-hmm. women have been taught to kind of hold it in mm-hmm. or we've been put down enough that you say, okay, well, maybe I'm, I, I am overstepping my bounds. I'm not supposed to say anything here. Mm-hmm. And the same thing with, you know, kids speaking out in the classroom, right? Mm-hmm. Or how women have to apologize before they're going to make a statement or a correction, mm-hmm. you know, whereas men don't. But well, my overall impression when I first started listening to it was that I didn't find any of it surprising at all. Mm-hmm. I can totally see how this would happen. I do think that coming from uh, because I'm a surgeon too and at some point if you're getting too much difficulty with your patients you know if this is too much of a trend that everybody's complaining of pain or can't move you have to think something's wrong with your protocol I'm I'm kind of surprised that they accepted that Mm -hmm. and didn't think that the patients needed to be sedated more if it wasn't working for them that part uh, I was surprised to hear but listening to the women you know I, I felt for them it sounded terrible I don't even know, though, if every single one of the women on that podcast had experienced the lack of fentanyl necessarily. I think everybody's experience of going through any type of medical procedure is very subjective. But there are definitely sometimes patients that have pain way out of proportion to what you can explain. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how much that plays into some of it as well. So it's not just that everybody's minimizing like, oh, you're not really in pain. It's that there really are patients out there, probably sometimes more female than male in in my perspective, that have unexplained pain way out of proportion to what other people experience. And I think there is some truth to the anxiety route. So it's not all dismissive, but then we end up giving dismissing people who have real pain. It's hard. It's hard being a doctor. It is. It's hard trying to know when to take things seriously. I mean, I have people that I have to run tests on over and over and over again, Mm -hmm. and everything comes back negative. And they've had really extensive workups, and there's just nothing to explain their pain. Except there is something called complex regional pain syndrome, and that really is a real thing. People aren't making it up. I I don't think anybody thinks that people are making it up, but there's not always a organic or fixable cause for it. Some of this that is reminding me of the conversation we had, Kate, about, you know, how do you maternity? And you had said that there are so many women, when you are asking about their surgical history, will leave off the fact that they had a C-section and that this is actually major surgery. So sometimes a lot of things about pain and about, I don't know, they seem to be, women just accept that they go through pain and they don't really talk openly about it as though that were some sort of a big deal. But that's what I'm thinking about also with the retrievals is what is going on here in your position when women are describing that they're going through this procedure and they are 100% sober? What is going on there? Yeah, I, yeah I, I, that's actually never happened to me, right? I mean, part of that's because my patients really need to be asleep. Sometimes they're at a lighter level of sedation, but you can usually tell. Um, If they're sedated, they will move when you numb their skin up. They almost always do because if they're awake, they might not move because they're holding it together. But if they're sedated, they're disinhibited. And so they'll move with every bit of pain. So you're aware of it. We always communicate with the anesthesiologist. You don't want your patient moving. It's not safe for them. Mm -hmm. It's not good for the procedure. We didn't hear on the podcast from the Yale physicians and I don't know what their Mm -hmm. perception of it was, but I know as a a proceduralist, I don't want my patient moving. And some of the women were saying, you know, they would say, hey, I can't get this egg if you don't hold still. I don't know if they got kind of numb to it, that that became normalized if it went on too long. But I think there's a lot we don't know about the story. If it really was only a couple of months 
like the court case said that this was ongoing, that patients didn't have fentanyl, you'd expect to see a big change in how the procedures were going. And you'd think that that would initiate something. I mean, that the, they would talk about or they'd say something's not working with their protocol or we need to put them to sleep because I was completely out for my egg retrievals. Mm-hmm. I was completely. too. I had propofol, but, and that was the first time I ever had anesthesia. So I was going in there anxious and it was smooth. Yeah. So I was very I surprised. Had, I had propofol too. And it sounded like they weren't using propofol. And I do remember when I was a patient, my physician did mention to me, oh, well, there's some institutions that don't put their patients to sleep at all. And I thought, oh, really? Like, I wouldn't want that. I would have too much anxiety. But if suddenly everybody's moving or screaming in pain, then something you'd think that that would trigger more warnings than it did. So either the fentanyl was missing for a longer period of time, or maybe like there were some women that said they experienced that kind of pain and it was outside of that time frame. And the podcast left it off like, well, maybe she'd been stealing fentanyl for longer. Well, maybe maybe the combo of fentanyl and what was it, uh, Ativan or Valium mm-hmm. that they're giving patients, um, Versed, wasn't adequate to treat everybody. And then what percentage tend to have a bad reaction? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that is not being REI. Yeah. I've done some procedures in the office with Versed and I typically don't have fentanyl. I don't use fentanyl, but I will do a a numbing medicine. And that usually gets patients through like a a small procedure in the office. And I will say that sometimes that's our titration. Like we will see, okay, how sleepy or how sedated the patient is. And so I'm surprised too, that there were some patients saying they were like completely awake. You would think they would have given them more medication, but in a sense, perhaps they were also to a point, you know, they had seen so many of these, they got comfortable with the fact that this is just normal. This is just par for the course. We're just going to get through it. So I seriously don't know, but perhaps they had been seeing this happen for a while and then they got numb to it. So this podcast was at the top of the charts for a really long time. Why do you think that is? What is the allure of the story? I think the story is intriguing. Certainly, I don't know. Um, I don't know about you, Kate, but I think people like to hear these things that go on in medicine that I do feel, and this is, this is just a personal opinion, that a lot of patients who don't have somebody in the medical field are at a disadvantage sometimes in the medical arena because they will say, oh, then that's what the doctor told me. This is what it is. You also had some nurse anesthetists, right? There was a nurse anesthetist that was on there and she questioned, but then her colleagues who were other nurses were saying, oh, it might've just, might've just been the way you were to fentanyl. Maybe you're not sensitive to fentanyl, whatever. But I do think that where I was going with this is that Without that medical knowledge, sometimes we will tell ourselves, okay, well, they know better. This must be what it is. I have to get through this pain. It is important, I think, for a lot of people to have more a medical advocate, somebody who knows what's supposed to be going on. Because if it were you, Kate, right, going through this, would you have questioned your response? I think I would have asked if that was the norm for everybody. I think the per- person I identified with the most on the podcast is probably that trauma surgeon that was on there. Mm-hmm. One, because it's not far off from what I do, but because she was somebody who, you know, you don't become a trauma surgeon if you don't know how to take a punch, get knocked down and, and get back up again, mm-hmm. you know. And maybe it's not physical pain, but still it's pretty tough. And she said that she realized, oh my God, I'm going to have to go through this completely sober, but then ended up coming into her own emergency room because she had so much pain afterwards. And I think there is something to the connection that the women who didn't receive any pain medicine during the procedure had more pain afterwards, because that's the whole reason we do blocks and stuff. Mm -hmm. So you want to um, anesthetize the tissue first so that the experience isn't painful when it's happening. Mm -hmm. You don't prime for pain afterwards. When we do procedures, we numb the skin first, not just when the patient's awake, but also when they're asleep. You will numb the lining of the stomach, the peritoneum, before you insert something into it, because that will actually help with post-op pain too. Because if you have no painkiller going on when the injury is happening, then the pain afterwards is more severe. 
So I think that's how I explained the severe pain people were in afterwards if they didn't have any pain medicine during the procedure. I think that that's definitely something for most of them. And then I think maybe some patients were just those sort of people who have a aberrant pain response too. How is patient relationship talked about on your end? Even in medical school, mm -hmm. what kind of conversations are there or lessons about patient care, like that relationship that you have with the patient, or, or is that a thing? Oh, it's definitely a thing. It's definitely a thing in medical school. And they will also bring in, um, even in residency or after, there will often be people who come in talking about how to show empathy and body language, how to read people, how to create a connection with the patient. Because if you have a better connection with your patient, they're more likely to listen to you. I think it's really critical for primary care physicians, family practitioners, because they have longstanding relationships with their patients. Sometimes surgeons do too, but hopefully for most people not. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I there was an article about this, about how there was not a lot of data behind it, but they did look at, and their evidence was showing that women, uh, female surgeons have better outcomes with their patients. And that is probably for another topic, but the question might be, okay, well, why is that the case? And it could be that women are more likely to listen to their patients. I will say a lot of times I will have patients coming to see me who've had previous surgery already and they want a revision, right? A revision procedure, but they'll say, I didn't go back to my doctor because he just discounted it. And I just need confirmation that what I'm saying you see, you know? And so I do get that from time to time. I'll have people who have already had surgery. They think that they want to get a revision, but they feel that their surgeon didn't listen to them. And typically it's a male. And they'll say, I just want justification. I just want to know that what I'm seeing, you would do something for, because I feel like I might be crazy and my surgeon's making me feel like I'm crazy. So that might be, you know, a different realm we were just talking about because it just opened another bag there. But, you know, it could be that that's the case. I mean, we're more likely to listen to our female patients or, or even our male patients. We're going to likely to listen more and establish establish that relationship uh, with patients. I think it's important for the outcome, too. Mm, I can see that applying not just to medical ethics, but in the broader picture of a lot of professions. I'm thinking about this issue with narcotics because it's reminding me of when I got my C-section and I was prescribed mm -hmm. narcotics. And after the C-section, the first nurse who saw me talked me out of taking them because of the potential dangers. And so I didn't. But then when the doctor came to check in on me, he said, mm -hmm. you need to take this. So I was just kind of confused by that disparity because I understood that there was this caution. But at the same time, the doctor wanted me to take it. As far as, you know, medicine and treatment and pain, where are we on the prescription drugs? Like, how do you find that balance between tending to somebody's pain and then also paying attention to the potential dangerous outcomes? When I went through med school, I was also in the heyday of make sure nobody's experiencing pain. You know, there's these little happy face pain scales and then they were correlated. So it goes from like a smiley face, like I have no pain all the way to like a really, really sad face. I'm in 10 out of 10 pain. And if pain scores were too high, it was correlated to how well the hospital was doing at things. And then you end up with our narcotic dependent mm -hmm. nation. And so the pendulum swung the other way. So there's a huge narcotic shortage now. But also, we're not even really supposed to prescribe them a lot. And then they're also one of the highest risk procedures for narcotic dependence is breast surgery. Statistically, I think women are more likely to end up with a narcotic dependence post-surgery than men. It's not like people are discounting the pain, but you don't want to give somebody an opioid problem. Uh, and so a lot of times, anytime people are asking me for refills on narcotics, I'm always always saying no. And I'm sure there would be people out there who say or are discounting their pain, but you really shouldn't be on narcotics after three to four days after surgery. I mean, it depends on the surgery, okay? But most people, for what they do, really shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. Some pain is to be expected. And so this is, this is where it becomes hard 
I think, for physicians to treat pain post-op because you don't want to be insensitive, but you don't want to give people a dependence problem either. And that's a huge societal issue now mm -hmm. that we overprescribe narcotics. It's hard because everybody's going to have a different situation. There is some real benefit to entirely avoiding narcotics after surgery. I usually give it to people and they're like, oh, I may not need that. And I'm like, well, well, you might. You know, I don't need you to be a hero. That's what I tell people. I was like, if you're in a lot of pain and ibuprofen Tylenol is not cutting it for you, that's what this is for. But don't take it if you don't need it. You know, some people need it. Some people won't. Um, I didn't take it after my first C-section. I did after my second, actually probably more for breastfeeding pain than for C-section pain because I realized I didn't, I didn't need to be that hero anymore. Same thing. I, I didn't take anything after I had my gallbladder out, just Tylenol and Advil. And I think in retrospect, maybe I could have taken a, a pill here and there. But the people who are blowing through, you know, I usually give 12 now. That's not that much. We used to always like routinely 30, 30, 30. You know, you're going home with 30, but people would go through 30 and call for a refill four days later. Yeah, same here. I, I have a same protocol and what I prescribe. And in one year, I might have one or two patients ask for a refill. And if that's the case, then I ask what's going on. So it's not very common that we're doing that. I think it, it's helpful when we set the precedent before the patient has the surgery about what pain to expect, what's normal, because everybody will have pain. And I tell that to my patients, but I will tell them that our goal with the pain medication is to drop it to a two or three. It's not going to be zero. There's not going to be no pain so that they know that there's going to be some discomfort. Going back to your questioning about like, why was this podcast so, it was so popular and people were so interested in this theme. I do think the general topic of it, I think that women do feel this way, right? We do feel this way that sometimes what we say is not taken seriously. More so like outside of just medicine, I'm not talking about just with pain, but even in a society of what I do is majority of the plastic surgeons are men and, you know, the numbers are improving, but we are probably about 17% of the society. And so when we bring up a topic, most of the time it's like, oh, it's not important until a man brings up the same topic, right? So it's a part of it is society tells us this is normal and we raised in a certain way that we think, okay, this is normal. I have to speak louder, speak louder. But if I speak loud enough, I also come off too rough. So we're trying to balance this sort of what's too much and what's too little. Whereas we don't have that same, you don't have the same mindset with men. It's like, this is my opinion and I'm going to say it and that's it, you know? Whereas we have to go, well, how I say it is going to be important as to how loud what voice I use, what words I use. It's just this, it's a, it's a totally different, I think, mindset for what women have to go through versus men. What did you think about the way that this unfolded or what stood out to you the most about, I don't know, about the nurse and all of that stuff? I think the part that was more disturbing to me was that she didn't lose her nursing license. I, I had feelings about whether or not there should be jail time. I think probably for something like this. Uh, I didn't think that was so terrible. I think what did disturb me was that she didn't lose her nursing license because this is different. Now, this is um, not the first medical provider to have a fentanyl problem. It's the people with access will end up with a problem more often. Yeah. You know, like for me, I don't know about for you, um, in your practice, but I have zero access to meds. Like I can't even get a Tylenol. I have to bum a Tylenol off of nurses. Like I would have zero access to something like fentanyl. But anesthesiologists do. And there is a problem with anesthesiologists and anesthesia residents developing fentanyl problems. And there are programs for them to get put back into their position. And I support that. But this woman switched it out for saline. That's not how most people do it when they're stealing the drugs. They usually fudge numbers. They have their fentanyl on them. They top it off. You know, they take it, but they're not emptying vials and replacing them with saline. I mean, that's actually a lot of fentanyl. I, I will say that that was one thing that I thought was surprising that they said this only happened for three months. I don't know mm -hmm. how you develop that kind of uh, 
a tolerance for that much fentanyl that quickly because mm-hmm. if you gave that to any one of us we'd we'd be dead in like a hot second you know <laughs> that that's a lot it's a lot but the people usually are skimming off of it it's sort of I guess a no harm it's not really a no harm if your anesthesiologist is high but yeah there was harm there fentanyl has been around for medical purposes for a long time it's a very effective drug it's what is it 10 I forget the exact conversion, a thousand times or 10,000 times stronger than heroin. So it takes very little to get someone that heroin high or to take away their pain. It's very, very effective at taking away pain. I, the first time I heard about street fentanyl, I was shocked because I thought, how can something that dangerous be out there? Because if you take too much, you're, you're in a lot of trouble. But I, I think that what makes it so addicting is that you just need to take it once when you don't need it. I mean, there's a different physiologic response to treating pain when you're having pain and taking something like that when you're not in pain. So it may only take the one time and your brain's like, I need more of that, I need more of that right now, that it becomes an almost immediate spiral. Because I think the way most anesthesiologists get into trouble is that, you know, like their fentanyl staring at them and curiosity gets the better of them. And it just takes that one time. Right. And normally in our surgical center, we, there's like a box of all the medications. And then as they're drawing up towards the end of the case, they'll say, I drew this up and then this is going to waste. This is the rest is going to waste. And they have to let the nurse know. So I'm surprised too, that the nurse got access to it. And besides that, like, it had to be drawn up by her in order to be able to then switch it for saline, which is interesting because typically it would be the anesthesiologist drawing it up. So yeah, I, I don't know how that happened. Well, she was a nurse then, or was she a nurse anesthetist? Actually, she wasn't because she was one of the nurses that walked people through. It didn't sound like she was the one actually putting people to sleep. I was a little confused on that. They alluded to it. They didn't get into the details, but it sounded like a lot of protocols for basic safety and medication usage weren't being followed. And something like that is usually locked up. Like you have to type in your code into an electrical thing to dispense it. But then the anesthesiologists who have their fentanyl, they have to record, you know, what they've taken out and then like document each little bit of that and where it went to. And that gets set it. Right. Well, and a lot of this for what I do is elective. So sometimes I'll do some in-office procedures. For example, one of ours is a Morpheus resurfacing, and I'll have patients say they've had it done elsewhere. It's really painful. And so they come and say, I'm not going to do it if it's painful. Like, I mean, you have a choice, right? But that's different in the sense of what these women were going undergoing. And they're like, I want to get pregnant. I want to have a child. And that is way more motivating factor than I want to look beautiful or I want to go through these procedures so my skin looks tighter. So unless I can eliminate the majority of that pain, they're not going to have the procedure. Whereas in this, it was like, well, I guess pain is to be expected. It's that much important to me. I'll go through it, you know. I learned so much. We'll just wrap it up there. But thank you so much, Kate and Christina. I really appreciate you coming on to the call. Thank you, Gwen. Thank you. Good is in the Details is produced by Dr. Gwendolyn Dolsky and Rudy Salo. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts and you're enjoying the show, please scroll down to the bottom and hit that five-star review. And everyone, we've got a lot of good stuff coming. If you would like to join our book club, oh, I put up a new book. It's so good. Go to our Patreon, patreon.com slash good is in the details. This episode is brought to you by adamandinc.com. If you play bridge or if any of your friends play bridge, you know somebody who plays bridge. You got to get them to avonmoreinc.com. It has everything you need for your next bridge party. Coasters, tallies, smart playing cards, which are also awesome for kids. Go to avonmoreinc.com and I will link them in the show notes. Okay, until next time. Bye.